And so I was down on the floor, said a few prayers, and uh, and then all of a sudden, everything exploded. Two hours of pure hell. Napalm, burning fires, bombs, armor-piercing bullets, rockets, cannons. I mean, we got so many holes blown in that ship from the rockets, it was ridiculous. I mean, it was divine intervention that the ship stayed afloat. Uh, the closer they got, I could tell, and I could see the Star of David flags on it. Israeli Defense Forces. I don't know why they call them defense, because they were attacking us. That's, that's when I knew that, you know, they were the enemy and, and not there to help us. And our government still supports that theory that it was a mistaken identity. There was no mistake in who we were. You knew this wasn't a mistake. There was no accident. It was absolutely a deliberate attack. I still have visions of it to this day. I still see the stretchers that are being brought over, but more than that, I see the body bags. 34 men killed, 174 men wounded. There was blood everywhere, just blood everywhere. Terrible, just terrible. And Congress just looked the other way. The United States is Israeli relationship, which began at that time, is based on fabrication and lies. It's just a shame that our government is afraid, actually afraid to tell the truth about what happened on June 8th, 1967, and those that were responsible for those actions. Hi, my name is Ed Bechtel, and uh, I was born and raised in Northeast Ohio, and I joined the Navy in 1966, and uh, my first tour of duty was uh, aboard the USS Liberty. My name is Terry McFarland. I'm a survivor of the USS Liberty attack on June 8th, 1967. Huh. My name is Larry Bowen. I was a second class petty officer on June 8th, 1967, the day of the attack on the USS Liberty. Uh, my name is Philip F. Turney. Uh, I was 20 years old aboard the USS Liberty. I was a third class petty officer, damage control. Uh, my name is Ernie Gallo, and I was a communication technician, maintenance, second class petty officer. My name is Thomas Bradley, and I'm a retired uh, Master Chief Petty Officer in the United States Navy. My name is John Horn. I was a communications technician. Bob Scarborough. I was a cryptologist on the USS Liberty. I was a CTRSN at the time. I was uh, an E5, uh, second class uh, maintenance technician. I was 22 years old at the time. I was a CTR-3, third-class petty officer. I was a cryptologic technician, chief petty officer, and I was in charge of the technical research department. My job was to uh, get on the radio and uh, see what kind, of air, what kind of traffic I could pick up. My job was to ensure that the equipment that the uh, other communication technicians used um, operated properly. I grew up in Michigan, and it was fine. I was a country boy. My function was to intercept foreign communications. I was stationed in the research compartment of the ship where the torpedo struck. My name is Mo Schaefer. Uh, I was a CT3 uh, communications technician and uh, called an R brancher, uh, and uh, with the Naval Security Group, I was stationed on board the USS Liberty, and uh, I'm a survivor of the uh, June the 8th attack on our ship.
So to tell you what uh, kind of happened in my life that day uh, is uh, parallel probably with most every other life in that day, but we were all in different positions across the ship. So we all saw or felt or had different experiences happen to us. We uh, sailed to the coast of Africa and uh, pulled into the port of uh, the Abidjan at the Ivory Coast. And then uh, during that weekend we were there, we were instructed to leave Abidjan and go up to the Mediterranean. So uh, <clears throat> uh, we went to Rota, Spain and uh, picked up some supplies and, uh, and some additional uh, personnel, uh, Russian linguists, I think an Arabic linguist. And, uh, we sailed to the eastern part of the Mediterranean uh, to uh, travel up and down the coast of uh, Egypt and Israel that are in, remaining in international waters, of course. And uh, it was a spectacular day. There wasn't a cloud in the sky. And uh, we were obviously uh, at that point in the Sinai Peninsula. And uh, the Six-Day War had just started a couple days earlier. And we were cruising back and forth. Uh, the, um, and just at a little slow speed um, to uh, see whatever we could uh, pick up. We were intercept operators, and I was setting a position copying International Morse code. But um, suffice it to say that we were over there monitoring the, uh, the effects of what was going on in the Middle East and copying uh, the, the various traffic going on between the various uh, countries over there. So, um, on that day, around 11.30, my buddy Bob Eisenberg and I went to lunch, and he told me that some of what I was copying was extremely important, and that there was um, evidence based on what I was copying that there was going to be a, uh, a target, not knowing exactly what the target or who the target was, but that the target was going to be attacked. Um, apparently, whatever it was that was uh, being discussed, they didn't identify the target. They just called it a target. It was a uh, beautiful morning, and my particular situation was that I was topside uh, helping cleaning antennas and, and uh, just uh, doing maintenance uh, while I wasn't doing my regular job as a CT. Um, the entire morning we saw airplanes um, traveling overhead at very low altitude. Um, it was possible to see them taking pictures and so forth and observing what our position was and what we were doing. Reconnaissance aircraft clearly marked at the Star of David. We clearly had a flag on our ship and we thought everything was good. We were glad the Israelis were there because we were in a war zone. We knew that. We could see the bombs going off on the on the coast and so on and so forth. Um, <clears throat> one plane came so low that you could even see the, the pilot's uh, face and um, he rocked his wings and uh, all morning long, uh, as it, in fact some of the sailors were, were uh, sun, uh, uh, sunbathing, um, relaxing uh, because we, we did not feel threatened. We had a GQ uh, practice, uh, general quarters, uh, was called around 1300, about 1 o'clock in the afternoon. And I went to my uh, GQ station, which was down in uh, below decks in RR1 and uh, uh, Radio Shack. And uh, we were supposed to, at that time, uh, turn on our radios and see if we could pick up anything. And shortly after the general quarters, we were approached aggressively by aircraft. It was an unidentified aircraft, but uh, 
they uh, they came in at us and started attacking our ship. They didn't attempt to radio us. They did not attempt to um, um, inform us in any any way, shape, or form uh, to leave the area. They simply attacked. And uh, all of a sudden, uh, like a shh, and you, uh, this jet flew over our head, and we heard then the the uh, firing of uh, of uh, rockets and missiles that they were firing. And then I watched my friend Spicer, the mailman, go down next to me. Spicer tried to run from the starboard side to the port side of the ship, and the plane just sent a rocket through the uh, the L1 level aft through. And it caught Spicer on the left side of his body uh, with a shrapnel and, and ripped them all up. And uh, and Jim and I says, uh, I think we're in trouble. All of a sudden, we hear on the 1MC, which is the internal communications for the ship, Captain McGonagall made the announcement that we were being attacked by unknown aircraft. And everyone scrambled to uh, get back to their battle stations. Our ship was not equipped with any defense armament at all. We had four fifty caliber machine guns on board that were used in ports to repel borders if necessary. All of a sudden I heard the uh, uh, gunfire. I didn't really hear gunfire. What I heard was the uh, uh, bullets hitting the uh, top of the ship, or hitting the overhead. We could all hear the the bullets striking the ship, all the sound. The word was passed that we were under attack. What do you mean under attack? We hadn't heard anything. Not realizing, being well below the water line, we wouldn't hear the sounds above. <clears throat> we tried to see if we could pick up any information, and eventually the radios, uh, I guess because of all the gunfire and hitting antennas and things, they, they, some of the equipment started to smoke, so we had to shut it all down. I was headed back to my repair station when uh, the explosion started. I went immediately back to my damage control station and started putting together a repair team as much as I could because a lot of them I didn't know where they were at, if they were dead or shot or whatever. At one point, I was asked, told to uh, find a stretcher and take it up to the bridge. Um, and uh, so I left my general quarters area and found my way. It took me a while to find a stretcher. They were all in high demand at that point and uh, found one and took it up to the bridge. And uh, it was a bloody mess up there. Um, we had uh, uh, Captain McGonagall was injured. Uh, Commander Thompson was extremely injured. And there was, um, I believe, a bosun's mate that was was uh, killed at, at that point that I was up there. There were many, many guys on that ship that were blown, back, blown up really, really bad. During that time, uh, there, was, there were many sorties that were attacking us. And uh, it uh, became pretty intense for... A while, the attack lasted. I'm going to say an hour, with ship with airplanes just continuously attacking us with rockets, um, napalm, uh, whatever armament they had. But um, and then it uh, seemed like a, a, a long time before um, the. Uh, Shooting stopped, and uh, and then we started uh, hearing uh, other types of uh, machine gun fire, and uh, um, I was told that uh, we all had to get down low because there were some uh, shells that were starting to break through the side of the ship. We finally heard the armored piercing coming through the ship. I was in my office when all this occurred. Uh, for all of us, the striping ones, I actually was wounded by one of them. I, I had 
got shot in the right leg. I have scars on the right leg where it happened. I have the bullet yet because it bounced off of me and went across the floor of my office. And I picked it up and carried it home. I still have it. And then at that point, uh, after it seems like a long time, but it couldn't have been more than probably 20, 30 minutes of this, uh, uh, it, everything went silent. It was just dead. And then there was this lull, again, trying to remember time. Let's say it's 20, 30 minutes. Uh, the captain comes over the speaker and says, prepare for torpedo attack. And uh, I looked at my friend Jimmy and we're there and I says, how do we do that? And I'm cleaning up my language tremendously there with that. I saw the torpedo boats. Uh, they, uh, there were three torpedo boats. I saw two of them. Both of them had the Star of David on it. And I was pretty excited about that. I thought they were there to help us because uh, we didn't know who was attacking us. The jet aircraft were unmarked. So we thought, well, who knows? We certainly didn't expect it to be the Israelis, that's for sure. And then I could tell the ship was at flank speed because uh, it was a, not a fast ship. So when it cranked up to about 18 knots, the tables started vibrating and you could really tell that we were uh, all out at flat, <laughs> flat speed. And um, once again, I heard... Uh, several more times to stand by for torpedo attack starboard side. On my way back down from the bridge, I did see, off in the distance, two more motor torpedo boats approaching us. And then finally, uh, I heard uh, brace for torpedo starboard side. And that definitely shook us up. Remember, we were young. We were all young. We were all in our early 20s. We had never been exposed to warfare. This was our first experience. We're scared. And uh, so we had never been taught in any military situation how to prepare for a torpedo attack. So we laid down on the floor, wrapped our arms around the table leg, and buried our heads. And so I was down on the floor, said a few prayers, and, uh, and then all of a sudden, everything exploded. We were struck by one of the five torpedoes that were released on us. When the explosion hit, it was like an incredible wind. And, and if you could feel things, I could feel things hitting me in the face and in the arms. And um, The next thing I know, I was being, uh, my, I was uh, shot into the air because of the explosion. All I remember is falling. And I remember falling and I remember water catching me as I fell. Anyway, I flew up into the overhead, slammed back down on the deck, and I, I had to, I don't know how long I was unconscious, but I uh, was awakened by the water uh, coming in the ship. I woke up, I don't know, maybe a few seconds, maybe a minute. It couldn't have been long. Uh, the torpedo had blasted a huge hole into the side of the ship. And what woke me up, because I was face down on the floor, was I was gurgling a mixture of water, seawater, and oil. And uh, then it's just pitch black. It's unbelievable. You're saying, okay, I just lived through this, and I'm going to drown, and you're grabbing on to people or what are holding on. When the torpedo blast occurred, of course, our first instinct was to get out of the compartment because the sea was rushing in on us. I was up to my neck in water. It blows this massive hole, 39 feet wide and 24 feet high, comes through, takes out a bulkhead, a wall, thin metal wall. The ladder takes out another thin metal wall, goes through the other side of the ship, through our research spaces over there, and there is this ladder, the only exit to get out, and God left the ladder. There was nothing. The walls were gone. There was one sailor that was ahead of me, the top of the ladder, trying to turn the hatches held in place by a dog, which is a wheel. And he was trying to turn it to the right, and that was tightening it. So I had to remove him, his hands from that, that dog and 
turn it the right way. And then I helped him on. Once we got that open, that was the first light to come down in because the space was entirely black. There was no light whatsoever. It was full of smoke and the smell of oil. Uh, what a scene. I couldn't move. And so I'm tasting the water. I'm waking up to the realization that something happened. And I'm looking around and I'm trapped in, in, a, in debris. I'm in like a debris pile. And the water is coming in fast because the hole we saw later on was quite huge. And uh, so uh, it was dark. So I fell my way down the passageway or, uh, through the RR1 to where the uh, um, doorway was into the passageway. And by that time, I was up to water on my knees. There was, a, there was a guy coming out of the PNR office, which was across the passageway from the RR1. And uh, he had his foot caught in the door. The onrushing water was uh, pushing it against his foot. He couldn't get his uh, foot out. So he and I pushed on the door and got his foot out. But by that time, we were uh, starting to tread water. So the ocean's coming in fast. I'm scared I'm going to drown. And I'm kicking and pulling and shoving debris out of my way. And as by the time I got up maybe a foot or two, the ocean is up to my waist by this point. I'm looking for the ladder, which Red Addington had come down previously, and it wasn't there. So I heard heard voices, I heard screaming and hollering. So I headed for the sound, and I kept going up and up and started swimming, because now the, the, the area is almost filled with water. When I got to the end of the passageway, I was swimming, and... Um, Apparently, a lot of guys had already gotten out. The hatch was about six feet by three feet wide, but it had been dogged down because of uh, the general quarters drill. And uh, there was a scuttle, which is a small round uh, hole with a wheel to lock it down uh, in that in that hatch. So I was hanging on to a pipe in the overhead and. Uh, we had about 18 inches of breathing space left, and it was waiting for the ship either to roll over or that hatch to open. So I rendezvous up, up in the ceiling area where the fluorescent lights were with uh, several other men that had actually survived, as I did. Uh, some injured. We were all injured to some extent, but we didn't know what our injuries were. We were just reacting to the fear that we were going to drown if we didn't get out of there. So we get near the hatch above us, which would have taken us to the passageway above. If we could get somebody's attention, that would be running by that hatch or walking by and hear us pounding and pounding on that hatch to get somebody's attention, which we ultimately did. Time-wise, I don't have a good recollection. Some guys say it was 15 minutes, some say 20 but it seemed like a lifetime because every time the ocean would come in, um, the tide would come in, we would hold our nose and wait for the tide to go back out so we could take another breath of air. So uh, we just waited there in silence and just hearing the water splash around and the uh, level going up and down with the movement of the ship. Um, until that hatch was finally opened. The bulkhead that I would have been sitting at was actually totally um, annihilated from the, the blast of the torpedo. Um, everyone in the comp center was killed. Um, everyone in the maintenance shop was killed. And uh, a good number of the people in the radio research spaces were uh, were killed or wounded as a result of that. I, I'm just fortunate to have survived it because there was a lot of sailors that were killed. Uh, the space that was forwarded of mine, there was only one person that made it out of that space alive, and that's because he got hit with a bullet, you know, and was on his way to Medical Central uh, when the torpedo hit and everybody else in that space was, was killed. 
And after it happened, I went out the door to my room and the hatch to go down to the next deck below was right there. And I opened it up and saw two of my friends that were dead right below me on the, on the deck below. I went down to see if there was anything I could do, but it was all up full of water and there was really nothing I could do. It was, it was a mess, to say the very least. Um, we had 25 members of the crew that were, um, ended up in that watery tomb before we ended up closing it up. Uh, and uh, that, that was something that was probably the hardest thing I ever had, had to do in my life. When, um, when the water kept rising and we got to the point where it looked like the water was going to come up out of the, the spaces. Lieutenant Bennett said uh, that he wanted to get uh, everyone out of there. And he, he said with emotion in his voice, if anyone is still alive in there, pound on a pipe, um, let us know that you're alive, and we'll come in and get you. And we heard no, no one you know, call out. No one was pounding on any pipes at that time. And, and we dogged on the hatches and, and closed up everything. And uh, we did <clears throat> um, make our way onto the ladder so to, to go topside or at least go to the next level. And they started pulling us out of the water one by one and giving us uh, life preservers. Uh, Larry Bowen was standing there with a life jacket, gave, handed, and, and he was passing those out as, uh, as we came uh, up in that uh, next level and uh, said, head, go topside. And word came down to prepare to abandon ship because we weren't sure if the ship was going to actually sink you get up there, you see this napalm burning fires. There was so much shrapnel on the deck at that time that I, um, I was wearing leather sole shoes and the, the shrapnel stuck into my shoes. Every time I tried to stand up, I would slide down to, the, uh, to where the uh, starboard side of the ship was uh, partly, the main deck was partly in the water. And so, uh, literally hung on to things to try to pull myself back up. There's one of my fellow sailors, right? There's a hatchway right coming into that compartment. And it turned out it was a postal clerk. And I had heard that he'd gone outside to take a look and it was machine gunned. And our, one of our medics um, was trying to keep him alive and he needed help. And Ernie Gallo and I and the third class corpsman um, tried to tried to you know provide triage to, to keep him alive. And he had a um, life jacket tightly wrapped around him because he received um, punctures to his lungs, and we were trying to keep him breathing and keep keep the um, in other words. Uh, uh, um, the air within his chest. He was so badly damaged that uh, the only way that the uh, corpsman could, could keep him breathing was to do a tracheotomy. And in the meantime, Ernie and I were doing mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation um, and uh, chest press compressions to try and keep him alive. Uh, we kept that going until the medic came back uh, to us and pronounced him dead. We had heard him say, I've been on this ship so long, I'll probably die on this ship. And he did end up dying on that ship. And after that, um, I had to uh, ask, ask to be given a, a chance to go outside and get some fresh air. So uh, at that point, Things kind of quieted down, but then uh, 
there were additional approaches by motor, motor torpedo boats. And uh, so we had to go through that drill again of preparing. But fortunately, we uh, weren't hit by any more torpedoes, but the motor torpedo boats did strafe our ship, um, shooting our uh, life rafts, shooting personnel on board, trying to put out fires from the napalm attack. Um, the lifeboat that I was uh, scheduled to be on, uh, it was the only one on, on my side of the ship that uh, stayed afloat. Uh, but eventually the, the torpedo boats ended up putting, putting shells into that one. And, you know, there, there, there wouldn't have been any, any, uh, tor any boats, any lifeboats that would have been, uh, able to be used. So they were planning on putting us down. Came extremely close to that. The life ramps were shot up. I did see that in there. Like I said, there was so much shrapnel on the ground. There were holes uh, everywhere. And I look over and I see my friend Birdman laying on the floor with his head, I have his head shot off or whatever with a fire hose almost drowning him. I could see the three poor torpedo boats back on the horizon. I could see what looked like a uh, aircraft approaching from the starboard side. The motor torpedo boats continued to fire the 40 millimeter cannons um, at the bulkheads of, on, of the ship. Uh, the closer they got, I could tell, and I could see the Star of David flags on it. So that's that's when I knew that they were Israelis. Um, and that's, that's when I knew that, you know, they were the enemy and, and not there to help us. There was quite a bit of confusion and not having a, an actual duty station. Uh, I heard over the loudspeaker that we were to stand by to repel borders. We heard helicopters hovering and someone passed the word that they were Israelis. Uh, I had no idea that all of this was being per per perpetrated by the Israelis. So I went running outside to see what 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 these what the helicopters were going to do, and and I saw armed troops. They sent over uh, Marines, uh, IDF Marines, uh, Israeli Defense Forces. I don't know why they call them defense because they were attacking us. And I'm saying, I just lived through a tor uh, excuse me an attack on the top side in the sun. Whatever I just lived through a torpedo hitting a room. I just got to the top of the ship or whatever, and now they're going to shoot and kill me. There was a helicopter outside that I could see out through one of the holes with men at the doorway. I figured they'd be shortly coming on board. It looked like they were coming in to, uh, you know, board the ship. So I wasn't to be taken without a fight. We didn't have a key for a repel border locker for for the for the gun cabinet. Uh, our our first class, our second class petty officer, uh, gunner's mate Thompson, uh, was up in one of the gun tubs, and he had the keys for that. The gunner was literally blown to pieces. His body was uh, lying on the edge of the forecastle, and his blood was running down the down the um, the bulkhead there and puddling up there. It's amazing to me. There was blood everywhere, just blood everywhere. So I went to the station where the small arms locker was and had a group of sailors there and sent one down to the machinery spaces to get a pair of bolt cutters to cut the lock off so we could access this, the small arms and weapons that were stored there. Uh, he never came back. I think Phil Turney was trying to get into the locker to no avail. He was trying to open it up with a uh, hammer and an axe. Uh, and we just, we couldn't get into there to, to get any weapons to repel borders. And at that time, they called off the attack. 
and the torpedo boats turned away. Why they didn't stay, why they didn't attempt to, to board the ship, I don't know. However, there was really no safe place for the helicopters to put down onto the ship. Um, and I don't know if they had rope ladders or whatever to, uh, to, to put troops onto the decks of the ship. But thank God it, it didn't happen. I personally, firsthand, don't know, didn't know why that happened. But subsequently, I heard that we were able to get a communication out from the ship, an SOS, indicating that what our situation was. And they took all of our antennas out on the first pass or so. And we were a spy ship, and they're all gone, all of our communications. Luckily, one guy, Terry Haldabaldier, got a message out on a uh, jerry-rigged coaxial cable on a tuner that he had turned off, <clears throat> and he got it working. And that's when we got the mayday uh, that a ship was being attacked. We did not know who it was. We did not know where it was at. We got one message back. It said, help is on the way. And it comes back to, what does that mean? Help is on the way. So you're sure that somebody, this fleet is out there in the, in the Mediterranean Sea, is going to come and help you. And uh, from that point on, um, we took off and we were steaming. And we knew we were going because we had access to the a search radar, so we knew roughly that we were headed for the east side of the Mediterranean. That night, uh, I wasn't really sure what was going to happen to the ship as we were sitting there um, pretty much dead in the water, trying to make our way north. But uh, I stayed up on bo topside uh, and spent the entire night up there and uh, for fear that if I was to go back down, down below decks uh, and try and grab some sleep, I didn't know if I'd ever come back up. I, uh, it, was, uh, it was a difficult time immediately after that. Uh, a lot of things were taking place. The mess decks where I was stationed became the hospital room, if you will. Every every table, every chair and table was used to treat sailors for injuries they'd received during an attack. Um, I discarded my communication equipment because there wasn't any need for it at that point and started just helping where I could, taking care of the sailors. We had a makeshift hospital, or tri triage, uh, in our um, mess decks, our place where we ate our meals. And the tables were set up as beds. Uh, and we went through the ship, moving people uh, down there where, where our uh, Dr. Kiefer and our two medics were, were doing their best to keep people alive where our doctor, God bless him, Dr. Kiefer, was a solo doctor on the ship who had had his guts shot up and sewed himself up, put a life jacket on to keep himself together. And out of the 171 wounded, I'm going to guess he saved 100 lives that night. I was down in the Mestex, and uh, there were so many wounded people there that had, they were really seriously, seriously wounded. You know body parts all over. Um, you don't even have time to record everything I could tell you about the different injuries. I mean, I mean it's just terrible, you know, just terrible. They asked me to go over and help this guy, and I don't remember his name. He had a hole through his head with a 20 millimeter or whatever, another one over through here, here, and then I just counted because taking whatever. I counted 51 holes in, but that's still one single person of 174 wounded people. Uh, one of the guys came, was brought up, his leg was uh, literally crushed in a doorway and there was blood running out of his shoes. And I'm over with our commanding, or excuse me, our executive officer, Lieutenant Armstrong, and uh, he's on the table and says, I'm okay, I'm okay, uh, get me a bottle of liquor. 
get me this or what, so he can have his drink of liquor or whatever, but don't mess with me, I'm fine. So we don't, and we look around, and he just laid there and bled to death because he wasn't going to let a minute get away from people taking care of his crew on the ship. Tommy Thornton, the guy that I, uh, I had my guitar aboard ship, and uh, uh, Tommy was a uh, kind of a folk singer, and I was interested in that music, and he taught me how to finger pick during the, during the cruise, and uh, something I still play that way today. Um, and, uh, but he was killed. Um, I had shrapnel in my back from the explosion of the torpedo. I still have a piece of that shrapnel in my right shoulder. So I had three gashes in my leg, um, but I also had I was wearing dungarees, and I had blood on me from working with some of the other injured. So I had blood on my, my shirt, blood on my pants, and the adrenaline was, was pumping so hard that I didn't realize that I had been injured until two days later when I had to report to sick bay and, and strip down to be examined for um, it's just a normal medical check. I had minor injuries, uh, some metal. I had one piece of metal that uh, from the explosion had uh, registered in the side, in my one side. And I had cuts and bruises on my arm, uh, in both arms and hands. So, but I was one of the fortunate ones. I was one of the walking wounded. Other people had a variety of injuries. Uh, some worse than others, of course, we had a significant loss of life. The doctor and the, the corpsman were uh, doing the best they could, and we, uh, um, anybody that could lend a hand would, would lend a hand if they, uh, somebody said, okay, take care of this guy, hold this bandage on, do this, do that. So we sat there dead in the water, wondering why we were going to, going to stay afloat or sink or whatever was going to happen. It was 17 hours, I believe, is the the number of hours before we saw anybody coming from the sixth fleet um, we were told that help was on the way after having gotten out the SOS but we didn't really know what that meant okay and as it came out later that the uh, aircraft off the sixth fleet air, aircraft carriers was en route but they were recalled back to the ship toys, back to the ship's toys. We have what's known as ready cats. There are two planes when you are in a, 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 a tense area. It, we always kept two planes on a catapults and they were ready to be launched within five minutes. When we went to general quarters, um, what I first saw as one who was up on the vulture's roll and where I would like to hang out a lot was it was general quarters, general quarters, and you immediately, you, you head out as fast as you can to where you're supposed to go, but they were already firing up those two jets that were on there. And so uh, they were launched immediately. Our military tried, they were called back, by the political, the political machinery of our government at the time. Because the military wanted to do their job. Those aircraft on the America did take off. They were launched. They were on their way. And they were called back. Because they did not want to embarrass one of our key allies in the Middle East, Israel. And when the planes were being recalled, the officers, uh, which were uh, senior officers, not captains, but uh, commanders, uh, the conversations began to turn very angrily as they talked to one another. And without getting into the expletives, uh, you could tell that they were pretty angry, pretty confused, and it was almost like they themselves did not know why the planes were being recalled. 
all they knew was get them back down on a deck to quote, uh, you know, some of the things that's in writing already. And now their job was to bring them back, clear the deck, set it up for landing, which they weren't prepared for, uh, and to bring them back down. It was a whole night of not knowing if we were going to sink, if we were not going to sink, if somebody was coming. It was uh, just wait and see. But uh, then that next day when the fleet comes and helps us, we, uh, the wounded are flown off the ship. I could see uh, in the distance that uh, the USS America, and uh, even though it was still probably 20 miles away from us, uh, it was so big that the um, superstructure was uh, very distinguishable on the, uh, on the horizon. Now we were able to pull up alongside of the Liberty and uh, from my perspective, again, as a 19 year old, this is my first cruise. I'm thinking, my gosh, we saw the hole in the side of the ship. We saw how it was all shot up and I'm a farm boy. I'm a, I'm a hunter, a uh, fisherman, and I know what different bullets can do. But these holes that were in the side of the ship is nothing that I had ever seen before. They were probably uh, eight inches, maybe ten inches in diameter. Uh, they they said that they were thirty millimeter uh, shells, um, and you know then we uh, again sent the medical people over to help them, and now the helicopters started you know uh, bringing the wounded from the Liberty over to our uh, our deck. And it was uh, one flight after another, after another, after another. I mean, we had so many horrific situations there that were taken care of. I'm not sure if I was affected very much until I started seeing the body bags coming. And, and I think that's when I began to really realize we, we really were at war. That night, um, I went out with a repair party and we, uh, we tried to patch holes. The, uh, the, the uh, deck force um, uh, sleeping quarters um, were in the bow of the ship and there were so many holes in the bow we had to go around and um, you take a, a, a large uh, cone-shaped piece of, of uh, wood and uh, hammer it actually in the in the hole to stop the hole and uh, to keep water from coming in. Our captain in the meantime was uh uh, attempting to uh, get us get us out of that area, we didn't have a helm, a, a pilot house. We actually had to steer the ship right at the rudder. Our our engineers kept our boilers on the line, and were able to uh, turn that turn our prop and get us out of there. The ballast tanks uh, were tanks that held water, uh, so that you were couldn't level the ship. And so they uh, had to move that around so they could get try to get the the uh, uh, deck out of the water and get some. We still had a, a pretty good list, but not uh, not to, as bad as it was. Uh, and from there, we ha we sailed uh, about a thousand miles to uh, Malta, where we went into dry dock. After we got to Malta, and they drained the, the water down. We had a team of men that went in through the compartments looking to recover body parts. The ship had just gotten into the dry docks and Ron Kuchel and his team were still cleaning out the, uh, the 25 uh, guys that uh, were killed in the room the torpedo hit. And then uh, I joined in the next day. First of all, they, they told us 
initially that we could go on liberty and they were going to have a medical team come in and to remove all the bodies and and all that and uh, all those bodies were down in our uh, spaces that were classified spaces and they decided no they they can't have these people uh, that are not cleared for uh, uh, secret type stuff to uh, remove the bodies so we had to cancel our uh, liberty to go in town. We we had to go down and take uh, remove all the bodies that we could. Um, we went down into the spaces to retrieve um, remains of remains of those that didn't make it. Um, it was gruesome. I was part of the uh, part of the group of guys that helped take the bodies out of the. Uh, um, bowels of the ship after we got into Malta and dry docked and uh, it, what I experienced was worse than the, than, than the attack itself because of what we what we picked up it was the worst thing I've, that's ever happened to me is having to pick up body parts and put them in a bag and keeping in mind these were our fellow shipmates and some of our friends and uh, the bodies they were they were chopped up <clears throat> from the, all the shrapnel below decks and uh, it's amazing that more of us were killed incredible some of the guys that went down made two or three trips to retrieve remains uh, I was only able to make one trip down. I couldn't emotionally take it. You know how your mind works. Sometimes things are so bad you, you don't remember them, okay? And there's very, very, very few things that I can remember about that. And the one thing that sticks in my mind was I remember finding a boot, and I quite honestly don't know if there was any, if there was a foot in it or not, but I remember one of the sailors having a specific boot because I, you know, I knew him not well, but I knew him and I said, I know where that goes. And, uh, but it was, there were a lot of things like that uh, as people were, as sailors were trying to clean up the, the torpedo damaged area of the ship. Uh, it was very hard. Yeah. It's really hard. Um, and I think it, every one of us um, took time to uh, grieve, um, and and um, I have I don't I'm not ashamed to say that uh, I did, um, and. Um, uh, it will, the, 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 the memory of that will never leave me. I still have visions of it to this day. I was there when uh, Larry Bowen uh, found uh, Bob Eisenberg. And, uh, Some of the men that have suffered even to this day, this was their second and some had a third cruise that they were on when we got attacked. They established relationships. They were closer to each other. They were almost like brothers. <clears throat> I, on the other hand, had only been on there a few weeks. And I think primarily, uh, I didn't feel it as deeply as they felt it. And I didn't feel it as long as they felt it, but I still felt it. Emotionally, with some of the bodies, because, of, you know, they were in my division, uh, you know, I felt a little bit sad for, for them. Uh, and uh, I think in our 15-year reunion also, one of we had a young lady sitting at our table and once we found out what her name was, uh, 
I told her that I found I found her husband amongst all the rubble in our shop. And I don't know of anybody else that would have found him other than me. So, and I, I took it pretty hard. And I guess that's about all I could say. They cut out the damage, damaged the exterior walls. They welded new plates in. They also cut out all of the the cannon fire, the machine gun fire. I mean, we got so many holes blown in that ship from the rockets, it was ridiculous. I think altogether they had like 800 and some holes that uh, ended up in the ship that uh, from the torpedo boats and the planes and everything. All the holes in the ship were entirely repaired. The ship was almost repainted, um, which we didn't quite understand why they were going to such great lengths to repair the ship apart from making it seaworthy. But we wanted that ship to come home uh, beat up <clears throat> and bloodied uh, so people could see what happened. And uh, unfortunately, they... Uh, Painted her up, fixed her up like nothing ever happened, brought her in. Of course, nobody went inside to see where all, you know, there was no guts in the ship anymore. During that interim, uh, Admiral Kidd uh, came out to the ship. Then the cover-up began. Actually, it began instantaneously on our ship when we, when Admiral Board, uh, Kidd came aboard. He was he's he was in charge of setting up the the Navy Court of Inquiry, and he wanted to, I guess, find out, uh, get some testimony um, going as soon as possible. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the testimony never appeared in our in the Navy in the uh, Navy Court of Inquiry because it was um, quite damning to the Israelis. As a matter of fact, they committed. Um, they, uh, they they committed some war crimes. And there were several high-ranking officers that advised us in person, you know, never to speak about this. If you do, you'll be arrested and prosecuted. And uh, we were dressed down, told them never to say anything about it, and we ended up in prison or worse. And uh, The Admiral um, was very nice initially, uh, and then became very stern and wanted us to know in uncertain terms that we were never allowed to talk about the, the attack. Uh, we were told uh, not to reveal any detail about what happened. Uh, there were huge penalties that we were threatened with. $10,000 fine, 10 years imprisonment, or worse. There was the indication that if you, you talked, you were, be, you were subject to court-martial. Don't talk to your families, we were told. Don't talk to your friends. At your next command, don't tell anybody at your next command anything apart from the fact that you survived an attack in the Mediterranean and you provide no details. No matter what they ask, you provide no details. But we had people ask us, are you, are you guys on the Liberty? Yeah. That's all we told them. Well, what happened? I can't talk about that. It's crazy. It's stupid. I can remember when I got back home, the local newspaper came to the house and wanted an interview. And I told him, I said, listen, I can't talk to you. I can't tell you anything. I have a friend whose sister worked for one of the newspapers in Cincinnati. And uh, she said, we, we want to interview. Would you do that? And I said, I guess so. And so... Uh, they contacted me and said, well, we called the Navy and they said, there's no way we can interview you. We can't do it. We're not allowed. What a lot of people don't even realize is the USS America was a hospital. 
the Little Rock was a hospital for five of us. Those people on those ships were instructed to never talk that there was ever an American from the USS Liberty ever on their ship. And then uh, the old man, the captain, he got on a bullhorn and he told us flat out, uh, he says, we're stopping the mail. But what he said was any letters that are going out from this time on, and this is where you really knew you were in a blackout, any letters that are being sent out, uh, we will not accept anything until I tell you. But he said, now don't seal the letters. Don't seal the envelopes. And he had a team that would go through and read it, and they, um, and they did, from my understanding. And uh, uh, those who mentioned anything, it was my understanding, they were called up to go see uh, a group who would interview them afterwards. Uh, we had no idea who shot the Liberty up. Uh, they did not tell us. They did not give us any information at all. And the political aspect of it never really came out uh, until, uh, I don't know, days and weeks afterwards. So those people had to, somewhat of a trauma for their lives too, to wonder why this whole thing happened. And they're on a different ship and they can't talk about it. They can't go to anybody ever. Of, of they were threatened with the same thing. And uh, I think for, for the rest of the time that we were in the Mediterranean, it was like you knew, you knew this was bigger than what you saw. You knew this wasn't a mistake. So there was a lot of us uh, that were um, shipping out. Uh, at one time. So it was interesting. I had to say to Captain McGonagall's credit, he shook every... <sighs> shook every sailor's hand. When we, when we left. And we were reminded, <clears throat> once again, while we're in Malta especially, that... Um, we were, were not to talk to any newsmen, and um, I was, um, I never, I never left the ship. Uh, I did not, uh, I, I did not want to um, be and put in a position where uh, I was even asked about the attack. Then uh, they asked for volunteers to bring the ship back to the United States, and I was one of the nine people from the Naval Security Group part that brought brought her back. Uh, we conducted fire and security watch in the uh, compartments that had been, that were newly welded in place to make sure there was no leaks that would create a, a flooding problem as we transited the Atlantic. Um, we pulled into a little creek. We were there for a few weeks. Uh, we had stored bags upon bags of scooped up material from the research spaces that had been exposed to the torpedo um, and put all those bags on a, on a flatbed tractor trailer and took them to the Norfolk uh, furnace. And then they put her in, uh, put her in the, um, stuck her in, uh, in mothballs and uh, for a year uh, and sold her for scrap. No evidence whatsoever, ever again. There would be no physical evidence of what Israel did. So, uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was a cover-up. He never talked much about it. Um, very limited. I think the most I heard was when he had written an article for a uh, publication in the Reader's Digest, and he said, you want to see it? Uh, I didn't know it had happened, and I said, sure, and he handed me these papers with, covered with black magic marker, and there were very few words left after the government had taken out the story, okay, and would not allow it to be published. They covered it up in, in a lot of different ways. So I got to Germany in July of 67, and I was wearing my... Uh, uh, Dunkery jacket was called. It was because uh, it was cool there, 
and I had uh, my chips patch on the shoulder and the uh, USS Liberty patch on it, on it, and uh, I was immediately ordered to take take all that stuff off your jacket. And uh, I thought at first that was just um, kind of a side hurt. It was a spit and polish uh, base. And uh, you, know, you always have to have your belt buckle shine, your shoe shined, and uh, um, so I thought that was probably the reason. Uh, and then I found out other people had their duty station patches on their Dunkery jacket. It was just the uh, because it was the USS Liberty stuff that had to go. And I don't, I don't remember how long we were there, but um, I got a. Uh, I received a Purple Heart at the, uh, but it was given to me in a private ceremony in the captain's office with, uh, there were seven of us that were stationed there, all got Purple Hearts, and they did it in a quiet ceremony uh, in the captain's office, not in front of the troops. Mm -hmm. uh, Nobody pinned anything on my chest. He handed me a box and the paperwork and shook my hand, and that was it. I did buzz aboard of the Bronze Star, and they changed it at the presenting ceremony, and they changed it to a Navy Common Mission Medal. Although I'd seen the Bronze Star, and I had the citation, I read it. And then when I got it, the next day it was different. They took the Bronze Star away from me and gave me a Navy Commendation Medal instead. And uh, as, as we know, our captain who got the uh, Medal of Honor, uh, was not it was not given to him by the president of the United States there that doesn't happen they sent him to a navy yard because Lyndon Johnson would not pin Captain McGonagall's medal on him I got a, a letter from the State Department I don't know how long that took in Germany and uh, when the hell am I getting a letter from the State Department so <clears throat> I opened it up and it's this and I still have this paperwork that um, that the Israelis were offering like five hundred dollars for uh, compensation for my wounds, and I thought that's stupid. I mean, so I'm a twenty-one-year-old kid. I I don't know what to do with this. So I went to the JAG office there, and uh, there was no uh, Navy JAG officer. I had to talk to an Army JAG, uh, whatever he is, lawyer. And I said, so what do I what do I do with this? He said, don't be stupid, kid. Take the money. So at 20, 21 years old, I took 500 bucks and uh, signed the paper, which meant I could never uh, sue Israel for what they did. The problems I had with all that was that the government didn't admit anything. They denied everything. We were told we'd be court martial if we talked about it couldn't say anything about it at all, but it didn't slow me down much. I said pretty much what I wanted to say to the press, even though I was I was followed by an officer all the time every time I spoke. He was there to monitor what I said, so I wouldn't say anything. But I did, I blabbed too much, and I got in trouble with the Navy for that, and I was frozen for promotion, even though I was picked up for E8, I never got it because I spoke more than what I was supposed to. They didn't kick me out or anything. They just threatened me. But I didn't pay much attention to the threats. I just did what I wanted to do anyway. I helped Jim Ennis write his book. I provided a lot of the information for that book because I was in Washington at the time when it got declassified. When it got declassified, I sent it to him. And then the Navy found out about that. So I was in really big hot water, but they couldn't court martial me or do anything because they didn't want the press to know anything about it. I didn't say anything about it for years and years and years, and uh, probably 18, 20 years. When I got married again, the second wife, we're married now, been married 38 years. I didn't say a word to her until I saw an article in the paper by Stan White. And... I read a book called uh, Assault on the Liberty from Jim Ennis, and I began to speak out. And uh, slowly but surely, this has been a, a, lo- a lifelong mission that has uh, gone absolutely nowhere until recently. And I thank you guys for 
give me the chance to uh, tell a little bit about the story, but uh, I didn't really talk about anything for a number of years with my wife, my family. I followed the dictates of the leadership. My Navy leadership has said, keep your mouth shut. And I did. We all did. And um, it's just a shame that our government is afraid, actually afraid to tell the truth about what happened on June 8th, 1967, and those that were responsible for those actions. I have a Life magazine from uh, the week following uh, the attack that has a victorious uh, <clears throat> um, Israeli soldier on the cover. And back about on page 26, we were the uh, accident that happened. Um, the picture of the ship and... Um, and that was it. A short paragraph about this unfortunate accident, and uh, it's uh, and it's over. <clears throat> it was the same thing with the newspaper. I have newspapers from Cincinnati, the Cincinnati Inquirer, and, uh, and the Post that um, you know, this attack on the ship was on the front page, and then it was back on page three the next day, and then the third day is back you know, somewhere near the ads for the stores and then uh, gone, nothing else. Mass media um, won't, won't touch the story. Um, and if we try and put something out on our Facebook accounts, um, we get censored. And um, so it's, it's one of those things where you've got to be very careful what you say and, and how you word things. Um, so it's, I don't know. I, I think that's another reason why people just don't want to get involved anymore. And it's, it hurts us because we can't get anything in the newspaper. We can't get anything on radio or TV. We've tried to get their attention. We've talked to Congress men. We've, we've talked to senators. They say we understand. We we're going to look into this. We'll see what can be done. And it all turns out to be lip service. Fifty-four years later, we're still getting the same kind of responses when we try to get the attention of our our politicians in Washington D.C. Uh, they're afraid. They're reluctant. They may have other reasons. I don't know if they're being threatened. I don't know if they're being controlled. But I don't. I just think they feel like their hands are tied. I really do. But we can't get the true story out as to what and why we were attacked by a primary ally in the Middle East. Um, and it it hurts. It hurts to know that you've devoted, in my case, 29 years today and four months of uh, my life to the Navy, um, believing in our cause, believing in what we were doing, believing in uh, our missions, believing everything we were told, we believed in what we were doing. But we can't get resolution. Um, I spent 21 years in the Navy. And part of the reason that I did that was the job that I had was, you know, related to national security. So I, um, I had a lot of respect for the job. Um, I was supporting the National Security Agency. Um, I was part of the Naval Security Group. And it was, um, it was a very meaningful position for me. Plus, in my mind, I thought there was a chance that I might actually have an opportunity to get some of the answers 
that we didn't have. And as it turned out, um, later on, uh, I'm going to say probably around 1980, um, there was a report through the agency that, uh, that came across my desk, um, and it was the agency's report on, on the attack. And it was a whitewash, just, just like, you know, everything else. And I just, I was, I was flabbergasted. I, I couldn't believe that information that I knew should be in the report wasn't, wasn't there. And I, I mean, so, you know, for the past 54 years now, we've been trying to get freedom of information, you know, information released so that, uh, so that the truth will, will get out. We formed as a group and our mission statement was to simply get the truth told about the USS Liberty. So um, I found in certain situations that some people don't want to hear that. Um, and they will get in your face uh, to prevent you from telling the truth. Um, America needs to know that there are people out there with power that will, that will um, prevent this story um, from getting out there. I, I think the biggest reluctance of people wanting or not wanting to get involved is because of the, I guess it's the APAC that's um, got, got so much power that um, if, if you go against them, they, uh, they have the power to um, bring about, you know, harsh things against you. The crew have experienced um, hate and discontent simply because we want to, we tell the truth about the attack. And there is a group within our country uh, that are Israeli supporters that do not want that information to be presented to the American public. I go with him a lot to give his speeches and um, I see some of the people that are against what he has to say and knowing Ernie as I know Ernie, uh, I don't understand why they would think he would stand there and tell them stuff that was untrue. Um, he's always been very truthful, he's very religious. I mean, we're not a communist organization. We are combat veterans. We are decorated combat veterans that people do not want to hear our story. Why? And it comes back to this group that's bound and determined to protect this holy relationship between the United States and Israel, no matter what. We've had too many wars because of Israel in the Middle East. Our ship was clearly identified prior to the attack. Um, there's all kinds of speculation that our flag wasn't flown, uh, that w our ship was unmarked, and that's not true at all. The flag was flying, it was shot down, but it was also replaced immediately with a larger flag. Um, the insignia is on the side of the boat, GTR-5. They're as tall as a six-foot man, I guess you might say. Uh, and anybody that knows anything about uh, identifying ships on, in the ocean would tell you that that was enough indication to say that this was an American ship. Not some obscure Egyptian trawler that has that's been claimed to be mistaken for. So, um, you know, I, over the years I've heard all, all these stories that have been 
told to try to deflect the truth and uh, the identification of the ship should not have been a problem at all. And our government still supports that theory that it was a mistake in identity. There was no mistake in who we were. We were a marked ship. Marked. GTR-5 on the bow. USS Liberty on the stern. Uh, American flag. Uh, they know exactly who they were attacking. They took all of our antennas out on the first pass or so. The, the story that the, the attack was accidental was a lie that was developed between our government and Israel and fed to the American people. So the, the United States is, Israeli relationship, which began at that time, a close relationship began at that time, is based on fabrication and lies. I do believe that Johnson would have been in the middle of the war in the Middle East uh, as, as soon as we went down. Of course, it would have been somebody else that did it, would not have been Israel. So they all got embarrassed, which I'm more than pleased about. I just hate the way they treated us. There was a political machine that seemed to be working, and they, that machine put my life in at risk. It took the life of, of uh, these guys on the, uh, of the Liberty. And, and I think that that process really made me begin to question what I have been taught as a Midwesterner that um, fly to flag, fight for your country, uh, save it in, in good uh, uh, perspective for your family, and go home and live happily ever after. And, and now what I find is that they, whoever they are, they don't care. They don't care about me. They didn't care about the liberty. They didn't care about America. America. They didn't care about my ship. They didn't care about the crew. We were expendables. And that's how I felt. Is, you know, I thought I was doing my, my civic duty. And in the meantime, I'm just an expendable. I'm fodder for some guy leaning back on his desk in Congress, smoking on a cigar, feet up on the desk, drinking a scotch. And they've never probably seen death themselves. And I question whether or not they even uh, are bothered a moment when they go to sleep at nighttime. The fact that we couldn't tell anyone our story, um, of course, had an effect on each of us uh, in that um, uh, we couldn't get it out of our system. Uh, some of the some of my fellow sailors were uh, had had gotten PTSD very uh, that to this day uh, are affected by it. Um, thank God, I. I I don't think I was affected very much. Um. You, you know, with everything that we'd been through, it was almost it was almost important to talk about it. But you know, you couldn't. And that in itself was a lot real stressful. I know that it impacted him because we lived close to an airport, and um, uh, one night I heard this banging, and he was in the closet. He, he had just, I guess, gone to um, quarters or something. It was like uh, planes coming over, you know. Um, and, and so the men um, who survived lived it for a long time. My wife said, uh, we were just talking about that a couple of weeks ago. She said, Joe, I know you came home. I saw you. I, you. I lived with you, but you never came back. Your mind was over there yet. 
Had a lot of nightmares, I still do. Uh, yeah, I mean, you relive this. The anger comes out. It just, the flashbacks, the anger, everything comes back again. I wake up at night with it. I don't think I've had a total night's sleep since. I still don't get benefits for my 12 back operations and eight fusions. He has hearing loss due to the explosion. We can't seem to get compensation out of that. So it's been, uh, the government has been taking advantage of us ever since. They do that with everything. The government does what they want to do and the consequences are <coughs> of no concern to them. I don't seem to be. I still feel abandoned. I'm abandoned. All of us are. Our government doesn't support us. Israel doesn't support us. We're men without, without a country. And it's, um, it's just heartening. And then more than anything else are, are living with the memories of the, the smell and the body cleanup and the everything that uh, was our home, so to speak, and our place where we, we lived, we uh, fellowshiped, we worked, we had jobs that we went to to work to be totally wiped out and destroyed and then wonder what's next. But I remember everything. I don't, I haven't forgotten one second of it. And he never told me that because he doesn't open up what happened. But he did go down and he had to retrieve his best friend. And I started having flashbacks and um, nightmares. So it took me significant time, but not near the time that some of my other buddies did. And still some have not gotten over it. And it's just as real today as it was then to them. When I talked to you the first day about uh, the, the shelling that we received by those planes when they first came over, and it was, it was so, uh, my mind was such that, you know, that happened like a couple of days ago when I was <laughs> telling you about it. I, I ask myself these questions, and, and that is, why now? Why now do I have PTSD that don't let me sleep at night, that my bed is thrashed, that my wife wants to know why am I fighting, why am I kicking, why am I talking in my sleep? But I still see the ship, I still see the stretchers that are being brought over. But more than that, I see the body bags. It bothers me when I hear loud bangs like that, and it sounds like, what, what are some of the things that annoy me about? It sounds like there's bullets hitting and rockets hitting the side of the ship. Fireworks. Fireworks drove me. I couldn't stand the less fireworks. It just brought back too many memories, so I didn't, I didn't stay around when the fireworks were going off. Or I covered my ears so I didn't hear it. But it sounded, when the rockets could go off or the fireworks would go off, it sounded just like rockets hitting the side of the ship and they were everywhere. He cannot stand fireworks. We worked for Walt Disney World for 12 years and was in the park during the fireworks in the park. He had to be removed off stage due to the impact. Uh, he has PTSD. He does have nightmares. He does not remember his nightmares. He is medicated at night with drugs, so his mind will not remember those dreams, per his psychiatrist. He has wanted to leave this world due to all the hatred toward the government. No, we don't hate Israel. We have several friends, and my brother-in-law is Jewish. In some circles, the U.S. The, the, the Liberty Crew is looked at as uh, whiners, as uh, conspiracy theorists, uh, as um, um, anti-Semites. Anti um, that 
if you, uh, anything negative that you can think of that uh, 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 that one group can can think of and another, another is what what we're portrayed as as the guys that were not, instead of wearing the white hats uh, we're we're the bad guys some of the people do it um by saying stuff that you know isn't true <laughs> and they know it isn't true but they're just trying to make Ernie or whoever else is with him speaking look like they're making this up and you you know you know that they know they're not making it up but yet they're still trying to sabotage what they have to say. I'm a businessman. I deal with all ethnic groups of people in my business. I have a lot of Jewish friends, I mean dear friends, and uh, so I don't ever consider them a part of what happened to me. I haven't been anti-Jewish at all. I don't think, have I? I don't think so. And we have close friends. I, 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 I'm mad at the government for covering it up. I knew a lot of Jewish people. I did business with Jewish people. I worked for Jewish people. But, you know, I'm not, I don't hate Jews at all. Uh, I have many friends uh, from the movie industry. But, um, and I've told them story. I said, well, they couldn't have done that on purpose. It must have been a case of mistaken identity. Or, but, you know, flying an American flag, and, and I don't argue with them about it. You know, they're, they're, they're all supportive of Israel, and I understand that. And I, I just don't have to be a supporter of Israel. And they know that, too. What I would hope to see happen now, 54 years later, is for the truth to come out about the attack um, and the story to be told um, of what happened. And so that for America and the world to know uh, what we experienced, um, that this bigotry is out there and it's... Um, uh, being perpetrated deceitfully so that people don't know the truth. So I want the truth to be told uh, completely. What I'm getting at is that uh, the attack is just the beginning of the story um, because of what uh, the attack uh, represented to the United States. But we're all dying off. So it won't be long. This, there won't be many more of us left. The truth needs to be brought forward so that the people who come after us don't let it happen again. It's important that the, the world knows that this was not an accident, that this was a deliberate attack on our ship. Let the world know what, what happened to us on that day. USS Liberty Veterans Association's number one goal is to get the truth out about what happened, who attacked us, why the attack was conducted, why nobody was allowed to come to our aid, and any information at all that will bring the truth out is what we're all about. People should know exactly what went on with that ship. And I don't think Ernie or any of the other Gentlemen on that ship will rest peacefully until this comes out. I know that my husband and that crew did the very best they could for their country. And I'm very proud of them for all of that. And then all the people that I know that are writing stories and doing research and people like yourselves that are sitting here listening to me babble along. Uh, I appreciate that. I would like, I would like our government to acknowledge us and the cover-up that ensued and why. I would like America just to know that the government covered it up. I'd like America to stand up and say, yes, we made a mistake. Yes, we covered it up. Yes, we did this to our American people. Let the nation know what they did. That, that's what, what 
I think they're they're all wanting. They want closure to what happened. But we need our government to tell that, to tell the true story, get it out to the public, and let the let the cards lay where they where they will. I mean, these men sign up for to to defend their country. They they want to walk proud, and they do walk proud, but they've been kicked around. What I'd like all Americans to do is stand by American servicemen that were deprived of help, treated like trash, because all we did was serve our country, and we got stabbed in the back, not only only by Israel, but our own government, then and now. Both, Both countries covered it up and, and told us, the crew, never to talk about it. And, and they failed to open up their books to, to show us what, what evidence they have to prove or disprove what we know to be the true story. I, th- I think the Americans need to know that it doesn't matter whether they're conservative or they're liberal. They, the, the people that we put in office we need to ensure that they do their jobs honestly. Um, I think the only profound comment I can make is shame on Israel's government and shame on, shame on the United States government for collectively being involved in this. Make sure that you do your history and do your study on what's actually going on. Find out uh, the why and the what. And I would like to say, you know, you can't always believe everything that's reported in the papers. I think you already know that. So do your homework, do your research. America needs to know the details of what happened that day um, to make their own judgments. We just need you, the American public, to help us get the truth out. The more people we can reach and reach out to and have them reach, you know, other people and say, hey, we just saw something about the USS Liberty and, and do some research on it and start asking your your local politicians and your senators and your congressmen. I just hope that the event does get published to the point where it becomes, people start asking questions. Why? And the truth will be known. And perhaps Congress and all its infinite wisdom will seek to have the answers. I think if, if people hear this story and they, they want to help, the biggest thing that they can do, I think, is to contact their local representatives and, and say, look, I just heard about this, you know, murderous activity that happened 54 years ago. And, and you people in Congress did absolutely nothing about it. I want you to do something. I want you to, you know, investigate and, and have a full and open congressional investigation. Our end result would be to have a congressional investigation into the attack and have it finally admitted that it was a deliberate attack by the state of Israel. That would give us closure. But to have them deny it for all these years, that it was an accident to accept that premise, just doesn't hold water. And this is the, the only incident that I'm aware of where a U.S. naval ship has been brought under attack by any nation without a full congressional investigation. But yet, here you've had 34 men killed, 174 men wounded, you know, a 70% casualty rating, and Congress just look the other way. 
write your congressman, write your senator, uh, call them. Demand that our Congress do the right thing. What we've gotten is just a, a standard letter that uh, this incident, this has already been investigated and found to be uh, a case of mistaken identity, which we all know is not true. Call your congressman and ask him for a thorough congressional investigation. This incident has never been uh, investigated by Congress. Um, every bombing, every um, everything that happened in Beirut or anywhere else in the in the world gets investigated by Congress, but uh, this incident. Um, the uh, attack on the USS Liberty has never been investigated. Let them know that you know. The question is, would I would I serve the country again? And my answer is absolutely yes. I have. I love the country. Okay, it's a great country. Sometimes it's run by morons. Okay, and well. We have to fix that, okay? But that doesn't make the country bad. We've got a good country. And uh, things that happened to bring this whole attack upon us were contrived by people that had higher plans for their own agenda you know, but that doesn't make our country bad. And yeah, I, I'd serve again. At 74, I'd serve. <laughs>